Um, today's session is going to be about, well, Drupal 8 and Pursue for best practices, whatever that is. Before we begin, I'm Branislav. I'm a Drupal guy. I was actually a doctor guy before I became a Drupal guy. And I studied medicine and I had substantial IT knowledge, but they changed. So now I have hair and everything and I became a developer guy with substantial medical knowledge. So it's a change. Um, I lived until seven months ago in a beautiful city of Pančevo in uh, Serbia, uh, close to capital. Uh, but now I live in Rheinbach in Germany, close to X capital. So I changed. <laughs> I work for a company called Union Betriebs GmbH. Uh, we are working for, well, for major German political party and we are doing IT, internet, printing and publishing. So yes, it, a lot of changes. And the thing is, this session is going to be a lot about change management and how to uh, embrace, embrace changes but keep your identity, keep you know, the ways you were doing. And of course, in Drupal 8. Now, Drupal 8 gave us, well, new core, new APIs, 200 new features, new paradigms of coding, object-oriented coding, um, proudly built somewhere else, and of course, big. So it, it yells out with the old. It yells with, you know, we need revolution. We need to forget everything we knew and start all over again. And I really hated the concept because, well, I learned Drupal for 10 years and I don't want to forget everything. Uh, I want to, you know, start building on top of Drupal 7 and Drupal 7 practices and just learn something new. And it is really difficult because of this forcing, force to, to change and to, to embrace totally new thing. So let's start with goals. You know, we need to focus on goals because co goals didn't change. And our goal is actually to do as least as possible, to build as best product as possible for, well, and yeah, enjoy. So, and in order to do that, well, we have good software design. And that problem was more or less already changed, uh, fixed. We have, uh, we know what to do. We know that we need to build software that is good quality software that can be easily maintained, easily upgraded, easily reused and deployed. And well, programmers invented design patterns. And that's awesome. That, that more or less solves their problems because uh, you know, you have patterns, you know how to solve some general problems using some general patterns and that's it. But it doesn't really work with, with Drupal because, and especially site building because we are working with visual programming with settings and not really typing stuff. So that can be a little bit impractical for, for site building. So we invented best practices. Uh, now, they are similar to design patterns, only suggestions, how to solve some problems. But, uh, well, design patterns are uh, unique for every programming language, every framework, and best practices is kind of framework and version specific, meaning uh, whenever you change a framework you're working on, uh, you need to review your best practices or even redo them, start from the scratch. And of course, version specific which we know in process of migration from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. And yeah, they're also task specific, uh, meaning that you, know, you don't have that much design patterns in the world, but we do have a lot of best practices depending on what we really try to achieve. So I don't want to talk about you know, whether to use node access or rabbit hole to solve a problem. That's, that's too focused on, on a special task. I want to talk about general stuff. And of course, we don't have any literature uh, on best practices. Uh, we don't have any repository of best practices, and that's really a problem. We really don't know what is a best practices to, practice to solve a problem and what is not. Finally, we are not really sure if best practices exist. Uh, are they the best? Are they better practices? 
Should we just stop searching for better practices if, well, yeah, current ones are the best? Uh, so our first problem or the biggest global problem we have is, well, problem with deployment. But not any deployment because we don't care about code deployment. That problem was solved with Git. Uh, we care about config deployment. Now, uh, Config deployment is, was generally a problem with, with Drupal, and there are still a lot of companies who do manual deployment. Uh, are there people who are doing manual deployment here? Don't be shy, I'm doing manual deployment also. So unfortunately, we do a lot of manual deployment these days, even though it's 21st century and we have all those beautiful tools. So we invented something that will uh, prevent us from having to do stuff multiple times and reduce margin of error. And well, first thing I could think of we created was hook update and process. Who is using that? A lot of people, awesome. So I don't have to talk about it too much. So we just you know, use uh, some, some custom module and just anytime we want to deploy something, we write a new hook update and push it, pull it. And, but it's time consuming. And well, we don't have too much time, right? Another thing we invented was features. And who uses features here? OK, who doesn't use features? <laughs> OK, features are awesome. So they helped a lot. Uh, now we, we are able to visually pack stuff together and just create modules out of it and just add it to Git. And we know who did it. Who, if somebody breaks something, we know precisely who broke, broke something. So it's, it's good. However, it's not so good. Um, due to limitations of Drupal core and overall user unfriendliness, uh, we, have, we have problem with auto-increment indexes in uh, Drupal 7. To be precise, for example, uh, using blocks and putting blocks into features, you cannot do that without features extra. And features extra is something, is, is, is like hell. I hate it. Who hates features extra? Yeah, OK. So um, yeah, that, that doesn't work really. And you know, come on, recreate, revert, what's that? I, I mean, I, I had a lot of problems trying to explain what is recreate and what is revert to, to people who are, well, who are good developers. They're not really from Drupal world. I, that, that's, that's crazy. Uh, and finally, this is a big problem. Uh, when you disable a feature, it is going to delete every settings, setting uh, in, inside that's, well, uh, deployed using that feature. So you can use, lose a lot of content <laughs> by, by disabling feature. And finally, there is a big problem if, if uh, people are using features for something, but then overriding features in live, they end up with this screen. And this is, this is a nightmare. <laughs> this is a nightmare. And you know, when, when you uh, start working on a new project and you see something like this, and you're not really sure where to start, what to do. So first thing you, you can do is like create, create a group, group called delete me. And all the things that you don't need, just put it there. Because you must not uninstall it. Or even worse, you cannot uninstall it because it is like circularly dependent from something other. So it's, it's a mess. And, and uh, that mess happens like this. So if you have a thing called, well, you, you created an article. An article has a uh, node containing body, and which is a field base and field instance. Uh, and then you created another content type called listing which is actually also having body as, as well, uh, field and field instance. So listing is dependent on, uh, on article. Now, just imagine you want to uh, create a list of listings in the article because client wanted that. So you're going to have entity relation, uh, reference uh, uh, to listing nodes, and then you have circular dependency. And uh, this is a nightmare to disable because, well, you cannot disable it. <laughs> Uh, well, not without too much troubling. So we created, again, some best practices. And one of the practices is we can force our features not to be dependent one on another by, by for example, um, creating unique fields for every single node or content type. And that works, but it results with a lot of tables, and it's also a mess to maintain. Uh, who uses this approach? 
not so many people. Okay, so we have another approach. Another approach is a little bit better or leery. So we're going to do the opposite. We're going to uh, create feature for every single field we have. And then we can create dependencies, uh, well, for every single node, which also has a feature. And then we result with, you know, we have a lot of features, but, but everything is unidirectionally dependent of each other. So we can create views, and those views will be dependent on nodes, and nodes will going to be dependent on fields, and everything is going to work okay-ish, but we are going to end up with a million of, of uh, feature modules. Who does this? Okay. So it's, it solves our problems. Uh, but do we have to think about this? Because now we have configuration management. Uh, or short CMI. I don't know who invented CMI's configuration management. It's like occurring from initiative, but still, we still use CMI and I use it as well, even if it's wrong. Uh, so CMI allows you to do the stuff in the database, export YAML files, um, and then just add those YAML files in Git, add those YAML files, well, push them, and then uh, import them. Uh, who uses CMI already? Wow, awesome. So, and of course we have Drush, and Drush helps us a lot with config export and config import. And finally, we don't have problem with revert features and whatever. So, it's awesome, it's great. But, uh, let's talk about practices. What is good practice here or bad practice? I, for example, do not like the location of uh, exported files, uh, which is, well, in files folder. Again, this is totally logical because that's the only folder, folder that, that is supposed to be uh, writable by, by a purchaser, so it's, it's okay. Uh, but this is, in some development environment, I want this to be somewhere where Git can, can pick up those file and, files and just uh, manipulate with them. So there's a fix for that, of course. Uh, in settings, PHP, config directories, uh, array, sync item just can be changed to something, anything. And after Drush config export, everything is going to be working perfectly. So we, we end up with a lot of files. And Drupal took care of security, so it added uh, HD access, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and uh, now we can see hundreds of, file, hundreds of files with various settings. Uh, those hundreds of files can easily become 1,000 files in, in complicated uh, projects, which could be a problem. So my initial idea when I saw this, this bunch of files is, files is can I create uh, a lot of directories and just categorize those files so that I, th that I can use them afterwards? No, I cannot, of course. It won't work. So if we want to categorize all those features, we are going to use features module again. But it got seriously updated and totally rewritten, and now it is built on top of uh, config management, which is awesome, because now we are not using feature, features to deploy any configuration or anything. So that's, that's all by Drupal. We are only bundling configuration into various bundles here, or various, well, modules. Now, uh, due to the fact that uh, modules are being shipped with their own sets of config, and that's the feature features are yeah, using massively. Uh, and that config is, is being imported uh, into uh, active configuration of Drupal on install. Uh, Drupal cannot really detect the changes uh, on already installed modules, so features are taking care of that. Uh, of course, features are exporting and importing changes. They are uh, auto-packaging, which is the same they did before, so it's like normal. And they're doing namespacing, and namespacing is, re is really awesome. So uh, it solves the big problem of creating a feature which already has a module with similar name on, on Drupal.org, and then, then who had that problem with, with uh, name collisions of contrib modules and features? Anyone? Yeah, so you create a feature called blog and you're in problem because, yeah. Uh, so namespacing solves that. And of course, the best thing with features is it's a dev module. You're going to enable it only in development environment. 
uh, you don't need it on live server or on production environment. However, uh, you still have problem with dependencies. Uh, and if you're going to use features for your, your stuff, you still have to uh, use the same techniques you used before in order to manage, well, dependencies. Uh, nevertheless, good thing is if you disable a feature, you're not going to lose your content because all the, all the settings you created are going to remain there. And that's that's huge advantage. That, that's something unbelievable. Uh, so as a conclusion, uh, features should be only used to bundle configuration. You don't have to use it for, for deployment, and that's, that's awesome. Uh, and OK, so you managed to deploy your site, and you started working on it. And there is this huge problem with, you know, people, site builders like to do these tiny little changes in live environments without, you know, uh, moving stuff back to, to local. And, you know, that's that's bad thing, and we do that. So how to, how to save ourselves when you have discrepancy between your local environments and your live environments, and you want to keep changes in live environments? Well, the, the easiest thing you can do is, of course, to export settings in live environment, uh, add it to, to Git, push them to the repository and pull them back in, in your locals. That works. Sometimes you have a problem where you want to keep both changes in local and, and remote environment. And for that, there is a thing called Drush Config Merge. Now, I first heard about it six months ago, and I still haven't tried it. But I read a lot, of, a lot about it, and it uses Git to, to merge local changes and remote changes, keep them all. Does anybody know anything about this? No? You should try it. I should try it. Somebody should try it and talk about it. <laughs> and, well, this is my favorite. You know, just forbid config changes in live. And that's, there's a module for that called configuration read-only mode. Just, you know, forbid it. Goodbye. Problem solved. Now, our installation profiles that. There's this thing we invented in Drupal 7 to uh, create installation profile during our web development process, and then just all the modules, all the config, all the stuff we, we create just, just to put an installation profile. So once we are done, once we want to deploy the site, we are going just to, uh, well, push everything and install using that installation problem, uh, profile, and we are done. Who uses this strategy here? Installation profiles? Not a lot of people. Okay, so it, it, it's an interesting strategy. It's, it's awesome. It's easy to test and maintain, and everything's good. But do we really need them due to the fact that we could possibly do something like this? We could build a site in our local environment, export files, push them, do minimal installation, and then import config. Did anybody try this? How did it end? Uh, for me, it ended like this. <laughs> so it turned out config management helped with continuous deployment, but not with, with uh, initial deployment due to the fact that once you install the site, you get site UUID. Once you install the site another time, you get another UUID. And that discrepancy just kills the kitten. So um, as a way around this, you can just do minimal installation deploy files, uh, push the database, just deploy the database, and then you're going to have the same UID and then you're going to just push files. So, Or you can use installation profiles. And we're back at installation profiles, same thing we used in Drupal 7. So you can just create installation profile. And really installation profiles in Drupal 8 are not that different from, from installation profile in Drupal 7. So, uh, well, directory is the same. Uh, info files became info YAML files. Uh, install files are the same. Uh, profile files, same. Uh, we are not packing features, well, or configuration into features directory. They're not modules anymore. We can just add all the configuration to config install. Uh, and modules are in the same place. Themes are in the same place. When you look at uh, info files and info YAML files, it is really difficult to find the difference even though it's different syntax, so same. And the only interesting thing is, okay, uh, this 
uh, setting files or YAML files that are being placed in some magical config slash install folder and they just simply work. So one, one can really uh, be attracted by this and try to do something like, okay, I'm going to build the entire website. I'm going to export my settings into some directory somewhere. Uh, I'm going to copy all the settings into installation profile and I'm going to, well, install a new site with those settings. Did anybody try that? Did it work? Nope. <laughs> I hate it. So it didn't work. Uh, and turned out, again, uh, these files uh, were built to do con continuous deployment, not, not to de do installations. So um, if you want to do installations, either you're going to cherry pick YAML files in order not to break the entire installation, or you're going to use features. So uh, next noble practice in Drupal 7 world is Drup Drush Unsuck. Does anybody know what Unsuck is? So Drupal by default sucks. <laughs> Drupal 7, that is. So and nobody uses overlay, I guess, I hope. Toolbar is a little bit, you know, useless. And you want to disable those, you want to enable admin menu, you want to enable module filter, jQuery update, I mean jQuery 1.4, that's, that's ancient. And of course, uh, Drupal websites without ctools, views, libraries, they're not really useful, so. Uh, you want to do all that. But in Drupal 7, uh, Drupal 8, you already have all of this. So the only thing I could find as my standard unsuck practice is just to enable admin toolbar, toolbar which allows me to have these wonderful drop downs. So give them a try if you haven't already. Uh, which ends up with, with all the old practices and they're kind of the same. Now we have a new practice, totally new practice uh, in Drupal 8 which is like Drupal 7 as well. So we have Composer and Composer is de facto standard for, uh, well, all the modern PHP applications today. It handles uh, dependencies, it uh, provides you with autoloader, uh, it keeps the codes updated with Composer update, and it feels really good to use it. It's a shell thing and it's, it's really good. So, but the question is, is it Drupal friendly? Is it ready to be used in, in production environment. So let's start with, with basic stuff. So setting up a project. So with Drush, you would just use Drush DL Drupal and then install it. With Composer, syntax is a little bit different, but nothing, nothing too complicated. So sounds okay for now. Uh, there is this problem of, of uh, performance. It turned out uh, Drush is 10 times faster than, than Composer. So, uh, Composer with warm caches, totally full, everything up to date, uh, needs 31 seconds to, to uh, deploy, uh, well, working core, uh, and well, Josh needs only 12 seconds. Things can get really nasty with, with uh, cold caches for Composer, then it's more than two minutes. Uh, so, performance wise, it's not so good. Uh, and you need to set up Composer. You need to prepare your, 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 the entire environment and everything to, uh, to use it. So first thing you need to do is you need to use Drupal org repository and there's a command for that. Uh, then you need to make sure that all the stuff you download are going to be in Drupal directories, not in slash vendor. So you're, you're going to have to install this uh, library custom installer and then add some settings into, into uh, composer.json file, which is not a big problem. And then of course, if you're going to allow composer to, uh, to manage all your contrib stuff, uh, you have to turn, make sure that you know, Git ignores all the contrib stuff. But then you're in problem with, with patches. You know, if Git ignores and, okay, I'm going to talk about it later. Uh, so once you're done, you can get a module relatively easy. Compose require, I believe this is an error. It should be the Drupal slash admin toolbar. So yeah, but otherwise, and it's, it's okay. Once, once you're done with it, just enable the module and it's going to work. Uh, okay, 
developers might like only to avoid this composer thing and just just enable and it is going to download and install so it is not really a good well the best performance thing ever and I said patching so uh, you're pulling a module you need to apply patch if that pa if module is not going to be part of your git uh, then you need to apply that pa patches in production as well so uh, there is a way to set up composer to apply patches but it is not by default supported so what you need to do you need to add this library composer patches and you uh, need to then in this uh, patches file uh, add well connect patches to to uh, patch files uh, to well modules you installed uh, it's a lot of setups so somebody was smart and gave us a uh, Drupal composer uh, which is uh, well, starting point for you to bootstrap all your composer uh, projects. Uh, it already supports patching, it already supports custom directories, uh, scaffolding, uh, it has a git pre-built git ignore and all the, all the goodies you really need, so just, just start with it and it is going to work. Uh, so, with all of these things built in, if you are using Drush Make workflow, uh, Composer can really help you and replace Rush Make workflow in a way that is going to be readable to other uh, PHP developers. Uh, however, there is this big question. Can I sell this to my boss? So, I probably can sell Composer to you, your developers, but, you know, managers are a little bit different. So, they're going to ask me about return of investment. They're going to you know, ask me about, okay, so 100, uh, 131 seconds against 12 seconds, that's kind of bad. So, I still have not the entire answer. I know that with Composer you can save a lot of time with, on deployment. So, for, for example, Platform SH already included this entire composer build into their workflow. So once you push all the changes, well, in composer file and only in composer file, it is going to install all the required modules. It is going to install all the dependencies for you. It is going to apply patches for you. So it is going to be, well, it is going to do a lot of wonderful stuff for you. And uh, I hope uh, this process can, well, save enough time or provide that return of investment your managers require, hopefully. Uh, and to conclude, I started this session as, uh, well, story about best practices, but question is, do they exist? And I don't really think they exist. So I would really like to call them current practices. Uh, and why current practices? Because they always need to be questioned. They always need to be refined. So when you have some idea, uh, it should be documented. It should be time tested, rethought again. It should be shared with other people. Uh, again, refined with them. So other people should question and refine those ideas. And it is a circular process which returns back to, to uh, another questioning of practices. And hopefully that will provide us better, better software and better working paradigms. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, I can I can repeat, repeat. So the question was, if you're using Composer, how can you uh, add uh, your custom modules to, uh, to it? Basically, you don't. You don't. You you just push it in Git and continue with that. Unless unless you're happy to share it with other people, uh, and then then there is a process for that, of course, which includes pub publishing it to Drupal org.
doesn't work. Uh, so I can, can repeat. Does it work for multi-site composer? Does it work for multi-site composer? I have no idea. <laughs> it should be working. I mean, why not? But because it composer only handles files and dependencies, so and they are shared between multi-sites. So I don't see the reason why not. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to mention. My answer to the question that was asked earlier is we're currently architecting it so that we have a site repo that has a modules and a themes directory and then the composer JSON. And so then what we do is run a post script after you do your composer build that simulates those folders where they need to go for Drupal. I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> it's too much. Uh, but if you want to use the microphone or, but yeah. Uh, anybody else? Yes? Uh, ladies first. I believe last change was really good, and it was in September 23rd, uh, 22nd uh, on Drupal.org. So, and, and it's really full of new stuff and it, it's good. But uh, I suggest you to take a look at this. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, okay, so this Drupal Composer thing or uh, Platform Message example Drupal 8 because it's basically everything you need to know in, uh, about Composer. It's just squeezed in and with it you're just, you just clone this and you're ready to go. No problem. Uh, yep. Any questions? Uh, okay, so the question was, uh, what's the best way to handle uh, situations where you have uh, multiple uh, environments and you want various configuration to be in various, well, in environment? So I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I guess, well, that's, that's, that's really interesting question. I guess you would have to use features and just de decide where to enable those features and when not in which environments. So I guess, but it's it's a good good thing to you know to think about in terms of how to create this best practice for that or <laughs> recommended practice for that. Uh, yep. Yep. I, I can try to answer what what uh, the question about uh, Dev and. Uh, if you want to not to deploy devil, for example, uh, there is a drush, drush uh, CEX to export, but you can use skip modules, and uh, you can give names of modules that you don't want to export, so that it's not in your Git, uh, and you don't have the problem with config that you don't want to have in production. And another problem is with config that you want to be different in production or in dev. And you can use, um, I don't remember exactly, but you can write it in files, uh, some, like you can override the config that is in database with config that is in files, like in settings and things like this. Uh, so that even if in your form, in your config form, you see like, uh, CSS is, a uh, CSS uh, packaging, uh, compressing is on, Actually, it's not on, on your dev because this config that you see in the form, it's overridden by a file. And that's it. <laughs> but uh, there is a little problem with uh, Drush CEX skip modules. 
because it skips the models, but not always the config that depends on that models. And I'm currently working on a patch uh, of Josh to do this. And I'm not the only one, but it's still a, a little problem. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, it's uh, I, I'm only thinking about how to automate all of this. So that's kind of next question. If okay, so you need, still need manual pow power, human power to decide what is going to which environment. But it would be interesting to think about how to automate the process. Um, other questions, comments, Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, so the question was, if I heard correctly, isn't it possible to just uh, disable modules with, with some settings in various environments? Yeah, it's settings.local. Setting. It's setting so the, uh -huh. the settings file for each environment. Oh, that actually could work. <coughs> but then you, you cannot really, you cannot really, hmm. So you think like to have various settings, uh, local settings in various that, that could actually be interesting to try. I have no idea. But, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much.